Hello, thank you for tuning in. My name is Stuart, Unrepented Atheist, and I want to talk about my spiritual Sunday that I had. So I had um, two doses of religion on the Sunday just past. Sunday morning was a Christian church service. Sunday afternoon was a workshop run by a local lady on Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with him, but anyway, some more about him later. First of all, the uh, the Christian service. So I've found it interesting and useful for my own channel and just my general uh, knowledge about Christianity, why people believe, what they're like, um, the kind of beliefs that they've got, <clears throat> and the way that the uh, staff in the church try to shore up faith. This is what is really interesting to me because I wonder how they deal with doubt. Obviously, faith means you don't know. You haven't got evidence, so you've got faith. And I'm going to be talking about uh, John chapter 20, story of the doubting Thomas. So the sermon was actually featuring John chapter 20 and the doubting Thomas. And this story was presented in a way that seemed to give credit to those who believe without seeing. So we've got, we've got Thomas who was not one of the disciples who uh, saw Jesus in the earlier stages. He heard from them that Jesus was still alive. He doubted it. Now bear in mind that the 11 the 11 disciples who told Thomas, oh, Jesus is alive, the reason they believed, they'd also seen him. They were skeptical when the women came, or at least according to the story, they the stories, they were skeptical when women came and said, oh, we've seen Jesus. Of course, they were skeptical. They didn't believe either. Quite healthy skepticism. They hear a, a claim, an unnatural claim that somebody is now alive having been dead. They're skeptical. They don't believe it, just like I wouldn't believe it. And really, um, I mean, if it wasn't Jesus, nobody would believe it in the world today. There are very, very few people I would imagine that would believe that would take anybody else's word for it that a dead person is now alive. And when I say dead, I mean definitively dead. I'm not talking about NDEs. I'm talking about a brain that's been starved of oxygen for 24 hours, which in the medical world, in biology, would be complete mush. It wouldn't be worth anything at all. There's no way you're bringing that back from the dead. So they were naturally skeptical, and they said to Thomas, well, he's alive. Now, we've got 11 people here that Thomas trusts. Why would they lie? Now, this is the thing that Christians often say. Christians often say uh, to me and to other atheists, why would, you know, why would they lie? or not just in Christianity, but uh, UFOs, uh, NDEs, all sorts of claims. Why would they lie? And yet, and yet Thomas didn't believe. And he had 11, he had 11 who, were tell who, who were telling him that Jesus is still alive. He didn't believe them. Maybe he thought either they're not telling the truth or they're mistaken or there's some reason. It might not be that they're lying. It might be some other reason, but this can't be so because people don't come back from the dead. Although, although I'm sure that Thomas must have known that Lazarus was raised from the dead and there were one or two others, but of course Jesus did that raising. So, But no, he didn't believe it. And he only believed it, of course, and the disciples only believed it because they saw Jesus. They were doubting some Thomas's too. And Thomas didn't believe it, but he did believe it when he saw Jesus, when he had the evidence, when he could see the man arrive looking like Jesus, with holes in his hands. And it's interesting that Thomas actually says it's not enough to see Jesus. He needs to see the holes in his hands. This is interesting. This is a new level of skepticism because it's not enough that the man appears in front of him, say, are you Jesus? Yes, I'm Jesus, etc. Um, remember, we drank wine together under the olive tree. You know, he could come up with some anecdote and convince him that he's Jesus. But no, this is a higher level of skepticism from Thomas that he needs to put his fingers in the holes. He needs to put his finger in Jesus' side where he was pierced by a spear, in addition to seeing him and talking to him, etc. He needs all that evidence, and he gets that evidence, and then he believes. 
and then Jesus, and then he says to Jesus, um, you know, Jesus, my God, my Lord, or something of that type. Now, the way that the minister presented this story is that when when Thomas, after finding the evidence, uh, acknowledged Jesus as God, as my Lord, this was a statement of faith. No, it wasn't a statement of faith. He put completely the wrong, inaccurate spin on the story. It was an acknowledgement, acceptance that the claim is true. It wasn't a statement of faith. It's a response to sufficient evidence. And yet, the the spin, the interpretation of that minister was completely manipulative. It wasn't a statement of faith. Now, after, after Thomas acknowledges who Jesus is, Jesus then said, okay, you accept me because you've seen me and you believe, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. This is at the center of the Christian faith. This is what shores up and bolsters Christian faith, that you're, you're blessed. In other words, um, what do I take that to mean? I take that to mean that you've got some kind of gift from God. You've got some sort of innate intuition. You've got some ability to um, understand uh, to accept a claim without evidence based on your own intuition or your, your, some kind of uh, ability that you've been given by God. You've got this faith which is a credit to you because you've be you're believing without seeing. Now, this is similar, I think, to the emperor's new clothes. We've got these charlatans who say we've, you know, we've made these marvelous clothes for the king, but there's a thing about them. Only wise people can see them. It's a confidence trick. It's a confidence trick because it plays on human um, uh, vanity, human pride, human weakness. It preys on that. It's very clever because people want to be thought of as intelligent, as wise, etc. And they believe this. And it's a confidence trick. In the Emperor's New Clothes, it's a confidence trick. And it's a confidence trick in John 20. Nevertheless, um, throughout the ages, Billions of Christians have read this and they have been taken in and tricked by it too. Now, of course, the minister didn't present it like this. He just turned to the flock in front of him, in other words, the congregation, 250, 300 people, and he said, um, those who believe without seeing are blessed. Listen to what Jesus says. And that is supposed to convince Christians that they're justified in their faith, in believing without evidence. And I just say, it's a confidence trick. It's the same sort of charlatanry that we saw in the Emperor's New Clothes. Okay, so, I mean, that minister, maybe one day I'll take him up on that. I sat there smoking a bit in my sort of smug atheist way, shaking my head slightly because I couldn't, be, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but I should, I should have believed it, because why else would all these people be stood in a church on a Sunday morning listening to this, listening to these people who really don't know anything at all? Uh, they don't know anything in the sense that they're promoting claims which haven't got any kind of uh, evidence in reality, to any credible evidence to support them. Maybe I will take it up with him at the next next time. There's, they do coffee and biscuits after the uh, service. Maybe I will take it up with him. Yeah, so it's interesting going along to these services and hearing how people are being tricked. That's my point. Uh, Matt brought this up in the line on Sunday. Amazingly, he actually made the same points more or less that I made. Yeah, Thomas had the evidence. So did the disciples. But uh, it's not good enough. Uh, I mean, it's good enough... For them, it's like Paul got the road to Damascus experience. They saw Jesus in the flesh. They, they've got the evidence, but we don't have the evidence. And the people who wrote the Gospels knew we wouldn't have the evidence because there is no evidence. We've got to build a religion. This is a way to do it. We'll put this, um, this punchline at the end of this actually quite robust passage of um, skepticism. A uh, good demonstration of skepticism. But we'll put this as a punchline that you are going to be better. You're going to be more blessed than these disciples because you believe without seeing. Your rewards await you for your, your belief, your suspension of disbelief, perhaps. You are blessed if you believe without seeing, more blessed. Okay, let me move on. So the other, uh, the next uh, dose of religion I had, there was a workshop being run by uh, a lady, local lady, human rights lawyer, very nice lady, actually, very pleasant, 
got nothing bad to say about her at all. Um, it was free. Otherwise, frankly, I doubt I would have gone. Um, I went with somebody. I went with my partner who's into this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so we all sat around in a circle. There was about 16 of us. There were three men. All the rest were women, mainly middle-aged. And the way that the group worked is that she was going to, she, she played a 45 minute lecture that he gave or a talk to his adoring followers. And after that, we were encouraged to share our thoughts going around the circle one at a time. And that's how the group more or less went. So I listened to what he had to say. I mean, what can I say in response to that? In the 90s, I was into meditation, new age type stuff. I would sit in rooms full of incense, sticks, etc., crystals, um, you know, the whole lot, darkened rooms with candles. I would sit in rooms with other people talking about, you know, the meaning of life, uh, enlightenment, uh, the ego, all these types of things, going beyond yourself, becoming one with the existence, and all that kind of esoteric talk, which I now understand, and in fact, in a way, I understood it even then, that it's completely meaningless. And if you try and break it down, it doesn't actually lead anywhere. In the same way, Eckhart Tolle, he's not selling anything new. I mean, what he's selling goes back absolutely centuries and he's written a book, I think, called The Power of Now in the 90s. He wrote it. I think he started studying Buddhism and Zen, etc. And he was taken in by he was taken in by it too. And he made a good living out of it, writing his books, etc. I mean, some of those um some of those gurus like Osho and I mean maybe well him, maybe nobody else actually, but I mean he was always kind of interesting to listen to and he could he could sort of nail certain things about religion, dismissing them, etc. And he could he could sum up what was in a way wrong with um, materialism and uh, consumerism and basically the human condition. He could sum it up quite nicely. But that doesn't mean that any of the claims about being one with the existence or that there's any kind of essence inside us that journeys on after death, that doesn't mean that any of those claims are actually true or that they've got sufficient uh, warrant for belief. One of the things I liked about that kind of way of thinking is it didn't seem to me that there were any sort of supernatural claims. I now realize that this isn't true. There are there are supernatural claims in that Wu kind of uh, way of thinking, namely that there's this essence. And this is what Eckhart Tolle was talking about. I've heard it all before. You know, like human being is like an onion. You pe peel away the layers and the essence is right in the middle. And there's no evidence for this. There's no evidence that we have any essence or any soul. It's just another version of a Christian soul. In Christian, sorry, not Christian soul. In Christianity, the soul is something which holds all the memories and all the experiences of the individuals, and it journeys on into the afterlife, either in Christian heaven or in Christian hell. So there is this soul, which is also apparently responsible for sin and you know, all sorts of other absurd things. But in uh, I don't know, what can I say, in New Age mystic, mystical kind of mindset, the essence is kind of indefinable. Um, it's supposed to be your kind of unique being, but there's no evidence for it. They just suppose that it's there and that when you're meditating, you have certain experiences which make which bring you bring you to your the center of your being, as they call it, another completely meaningless thing. And then you can be pure awareness, all these sort of all this esoteric talk. And I'm not saying there's nothing in meditation. I think meditation is the one useful thing that's come out of the East. And, you know, meditation and maybe even mindfulness um, is good. It's good to sit down, close your eyes for half an hour a day and sort of find silence. But that doesn't mean that any supernatural claims are true. It doesn't mean there's an essence that journeys on. I believe that physical death is the absolute end of all being for a human being that's my own that's my belief um that's my belief i haven't got any evidence to back it up 
apart from the fact that we know that when a human being dies, the brain dies. I don't see any reason to believe that there's anything that journeys on, basically. And you would have to demonstrate that there is this essence sitting at the center of us or sitting somewhere inside us that does journey on. But bear this in mind. Uh, being unique and knowing who you are is a big thing with New Agers and with Eckhart Tolle and the rest of them, Osho's followers, etc. Being your unique self. But bear this in mind. Everything about me that makes me me, right, that doesn't make me Matt Dillahunty, that doesn't make me William Lane Craig, my body, my face, my, uh, my physical appearance, the way that I talk, uh, the expressions I use on my face, um, everything in my everything in my brain, my memories, my thoughts, the experiences that I've had, the memories of those, uh, the emotions, the things I love, the things I hate, my personality, all of those things are me. And they're what make me different from other people. And yet, New Agers... Eckhart Tolle and the rest of them are saying, no, what makes you different is this essence at the center of you. That doesn't make any sense because um, people know me from my body, from the way I talk, etc., etc., etc. That's me. That's got to be me. That's how, that's how you know that I'm me and not somebody else. So what is this uh, essence then? From what I understand, it must be perhaps that it's identical if it exists at all to everybody else's essence, this little piece of energy, this little um, shadow or this little uh, gust of energy inside us, which supposedly journeys on without the memories, without everything else, is the same as the Christian soul, except it doesn't carry forward all the memories and everything else. It's just this like, I don't know, piece of this, um, you know, this, this breath of consciousness that dissolves back into this grand ocean of consciousness in this kind of woo universe. No, I don't believe any of it. I think all that's nonsense. No, I'm not saying it's untrue. I don't see any reason to believe in it. So with this Eckhart Tolle, I have to say he's not funny. He thinks he's funny. He's sniggering throughout the whole thing like, <laughs> you know, he thinks that he's funny. He thinks he's got insights. He hasn't got insights. He's just one big charlatan who uh, probably read a few books in the 90s and he sort of fashioned his own brand of it. And it's been a very successful brand. Bravo to him for making lots of money out of it. And he's got adoring followers. And this lady, I wasn't going to rain on her parade. So when it came to my turn to speak, I said absolutely nothing at all. I said, I've got nothing to share. I'm sorry. Um, because if I had got something to share, I would have said, look, this is, there's nothing new in this. There's no evidence for what he's saying, etc. Uh, yeah, meditation is cool. I'm with that. But there's no evidence for any of the other claims he's making about the essence and about anything else like that. And the rest of what he's talking about is just psycho bubble, um, you know, designed to draw people in and think, oh, that kind of resonates with me. Okay, yeah, so obviously I said nothing. And in fact, we went around twice, and twice I said absolutely nothing. Others, you know, they were mostly, uh, only about two or three of them actually responded to anything that he said. There was one guy who uh, claimed to be a healer. He said, oh, I've read Carl Jung, I know about the ego and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, he was full of himself with all this kind of stuff and when I was mixing with these people in the 90s I found a lot of them were were full of themselves like they were elite uh, spiritual people they had the knowledge they knew others didn't they had the awareness that others didn't the funny thing is that this kind of goes against what you know the teachings because by saying Oh, I've got the awareness. Others haven't. You know, I'm one of the elite. You know, we, our group, we we've got the knowledge. We we're grounded, etc. By saying all this, you're boosting up your ego. You're kind of going against what they teach. You're feeding your vanity and your pride, which goes against, you know, if you like, the kind of essence of, I suppose, what Buddhism is trying to teach. But this is just what I've observed. Um, but to be fair, there was him. Yeah, he was a bit like that. Others were mostly what I call traumatized women. And I'm just going by some of the stories that were being told. 
you know, women who had been hurt in relationships and <coughs> they were struggling to get their stuff together. They were looking for some kind of healing. And I found this a lot when I was, you know, in the 90s when I was doing groups, various types of groups with people. I found this that a lot of people get into that and a lot of people get into Christianity because as we've had people coming onto the line saying, oh, I was in the gutter, I was an alcoholic or I was having various other issues, Christianity pulled me around, pulled me up. And I found as well that with, you know, with a lot of people that get into New Age mysticism, they're doing so because they've got issues, they've got traumas, etc. One group I was doing, there was a guy, this is back in the 90s, and I just sort of said to him jokingly, oh, you know, what do you think brings us all here? What do you think we've all got in common? Because not many people do this this type of group or this thing at all. You know, how come other people sort of survive without it? And he said to me, well, Stuart, he said, you know, there are some people that just sail through life. You know, there are people that just, you know, they've got parents who, you know, are doing all the right things, getting the children an education, being open with them, not being bigoted and you know, being quite liberal-minded, bringing them up. And um, actually, I must say that even even bigoted parents can bring up people who sail through life. Uh, and even people who are bigoted can sail through life. Yeah, so forget about that. But there are people that sail through life. They get married, they have successful careers, they're happy, they've got children who love them, etc. And they don't really have any big issues. But then there are other others of us who screw up along the way for whatever reason. You know, we grow up with hang-ups, with issues, and um, we've got low self-esteem, etc., etc., etc. And then we discover um, new age stuff, crystals, healing, etc., uh, meditation, the whole lot. And so that's why we've all ended up here. We're all the, uh, you know, we're the dross. We're, we're, the, we're those in the gutter. And we're the ones that didn't sail through life. We're the ones that are sinking. And we need somebody to plug all the holes. And that's why we're here. And yeah, I think he absolutely nailed it. I'm not saying that everybody is part of this because for that reason. But it seemed to me that the bulk of people who get into it were having issues. As I was having issues in those days myself. But I eventually came to the realization in my own life that nobody else could pull me up. No ideology could pull me up that I had to pull my own self up. And I left all of the religions behind. I left all of the New Age mysticism behind. And I realized that the only way to succeed in one's life is to actually do something and not, uh, yeah, you have, have actually got to do something positive and take positive action. And that is the only way. And there's no such thing as healing. There is no, all these crystals, all these healers, I don't think there's any good reason to believe that any of that works. You do a group, you've got a lot of euphoria. Wow, we're all together. Let's hug each other. We all love each other. Oh, all that's bullshit. But when you're doing the group, you think, oh, wow, I've been healed. You know, I feel tremendous weight uh, lifted from my shoulders. And then you leave and then you come back, you go home and you think, oh, God, you know, you wake up on Monday morning, Christ, everything's just exactly the same. You might feel like you've been healed in the moment, but I don't believe that. Uh, I mean, I know people that have been doing this stuff for 25, 30 years. It's one big industry. People are making a lot of money out of this so-called healing. I don't believe that it works. I'm not asserting it doesn't work ever, but I don't believe there's any kind of long-term healing for, say, childhood traumas. Um, if you've been abused as an adult or as a child, I don't believe that there's any kind of um, healing from these um, healers and these therapies, I really don't believe that there is. And the only kind of healing that you can get for yourself is to take positive action, try and get as much love in your life as you possibly can, find people that love you and that you love, and surround yourself with that kind of positivity. And then otherwise, just deal with, uh, you know, the, just deal with the sort of continual in a way, pain of human life, which is part and parcel of being a human being. You've got the joy, you've got the pain. That's just the way that things are. That's what I came to realize myself. Um, I don't believe that the, I don't believe that any of these healers actually do any good. And it's just a matter of uh, understanding yourself and taking positive action and just trying to get as much love in your life as you possibly can. I mean, that's my only message for myself. It's not a message for you guys. That's the that's how I try to live my life anyway. And obviously try to do good things. 
because bad things I've done in the past, I didn't realize when I was doing it, I didn't realize when I was doing them, nothing terribly awful, believe me, but, you know, wrong things that I've done in the past, I did not realize when I was doing them that later on in life, I would be carrying those like baggage and there's no getting rid of them. You're just stuck with them and you've got to accept you can't right wrongs that you've done in the past on the whole. And that's just the way things are. These religions tell you, you know, Jesus will forgive you all your sins. No, there's no demonstrable Jesus to forgive any sins. And it's on me. It's on you. If you've done something wrong, it's on you and you just have to carry that. And that's just the way that things are. There's no getting, there's, there's no getting away from it. Uh, you'll carry that till the day you die, but you've just got to accept it and just get on as best you can. That's just all there is, uh, as far as I can see. And all religion preys on this, preys on the pain that people go through, and they promise a magic solution. They promise, they promise a pill that you can take every Sunday, or you kneel down and you pray for forgiveness. But uh, it's all, as far as I can see, false. It's a business. There's a lot of money in it. And I mean, I dare say that a lot of those Christian ministers earnestly believe that they're doing good, but I don't think that they're de doing anything demonstrably any good. The idea that your sins and the wrongs that you've done can be cleansed is complete nonsense. There's, n there's no reason to believe that it's true. And there's no reason to believe that anything that Eckhart Hall is saying about, you know, the essence of a human being journeying on after death all that kind of thing. There's no reason to believe that that's true either. So, okay. Well, that's about it. Uh, yeah, I didn't say anything, and um, I won't be going to that group again. Definitely not. Um, I don't like that Eckhart Toll. I think that he's just a pure charlatan, snake oil salesman, as we call him, in the counter-apologetics business. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for watching. I hope that uh, I hope you took something from that. And, um, yeah, that's all for now. Goodbye.